Rugby Wrap-Up brought to you in part by Irish Rugby Tours, the Rugby Tours people, the Pig and Whistle on West 36th Street, and Lean and Limber. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to Rugby Wrap-Up's College Rugby Report. This week, we have a full D1A college rugby show for you, including dignitaries waiting in the Internet green rooms. So let's not waste any more time and get right to it. In the East, out of respect for our veterans, let's start with Army versus Penn State. The teams were tied at halftime thanks to a penalty try awarded to Army because of a late yellow card given to Penn State flanker Peter Jean, who was apparently caught looking for a last name. Okay, maybe that wasn't the penalty, but it did mean that Penn State was down a man and that Army had an advantage coming out of the shed to start the second half. And they took advantage of that man advantage. Two tries from number eight, Marco Polo. Carabata enabled the Black Knights to pull away and show the world that they have rebounded from some early season setbacks. Final score, 31-14, and this stuff just writes itself because the top scorer with three tries, the hat trick, was Marco Polo Arabata. Notre Dame College versus Mary Washington. The Falcons versus the Eagles, 5-14 to at the half because this is not just your mother's rugby team anymore. No, this young and improving team in its first D1A season gives teams fits, but they are yet to learn how to play 80 minutes. To that end, Notre Dame College went on a 25-zip run in the second half to pull away. No conversations. Wait a minute. No conversions. No conversions. We're going to be looking for a teleprompter person after the taping of the show, so please submit your resumes. Indeed, that 25-zip run was all tries. Final score, 59-12 to Falcons. NDC now hosts Navy in what could be a sleeper match because if they could upset the midshipmen, that would be the hugest upset of the year. Over in the Liberty Conference, Iona versus Fairfield, and the final score, 57-12. to But that does not tell the story, because it was 46-6 in favor of Iona at the half, and Fairfield came storming back. But two quick tries by Connor Buckley put Iona in control early, but Fairfield was not going away easily in this one, and they went on a 24-10 run in the second half behind center Chris Schiavello. It was not enough, however, as the Gales had enough wind in their sails, and the Gales were able to cruise to victory. Top scorer in this one, Connor Buckley for Iona, the number nine, and you guessed it, he had a hat trick as well. In the Red River Conference, Oklahoma and North Texas. Ladies and gentlemen, this was all about the Sooners number eight, Robert Ogilvie, who had a hat trick. That makes two consecutive matches with a hat trick for the number eight. And we all know what it's called when you get hat tricks in consecutive rugby matches. It's a Bronco. Google it. Anyway, that bucking Bronco, Mr. Ogilvy, is making a strong case right out of the gate at being player of the year. And he's helped carry the Sooners to an impressive start to their season. Indeed, Oklahoma is looking dangerous and now gets a break until January when they come back to play Baylor in their next conference game. Texas A&M versus Baylor. The Bears versus the Aggies. Baylor started hot in this game and led at the half, 17-5. Fly half, Luke Davis had two conversions and a penalty kick. But Texas A&M made some important adjustments and came out at the half firing. A 25-zip run had Baylor wondering what the heck happened as their lead was erased and the Aggies survived an early season upset. No doubt the Aggies are looking good, but they've got some important matches coming up. January 23rd versus BYU and February 29th, Leap Year versus the national champion, Life. But hey, the Aggies are definitely improving. Team to watch. In the Big Ten, the Big Ten Championship played in Obets, a lineouts throw from downtown Columbus, home of the Ohio State University. Let's start with the third place match. The Fighting Illini of Illinois versus the Wolverines of Michigan. What is a Fighting Illini? That's for another show. Michigan was coming off a very physical midweek battle versus Michigan State, so they had to be tired compared to a well-rested Illinois team that was able to stay relatively healthy throughout the year. And it showed. Final score, 
45-10, Illinois. Top scorer, Luke Pavlakis, with a try and five conversions. Kudos to Illinois. It's their highest finish in team history, and it sets them up as one of the teams to watch next year. In the championship matchup, Indiana's Hoosiers versus the Ohio State Buckeyes. This is the first time an Ohio team lost in Obets, a.k.a. the Fortress, and it's the third straight Big Ten championship loss for Ohio State. They lost to Indiana twice and Wisconsin once. The game, while only 7-5 at the half, would be taken over by the Indiana backline as they scored three tries in the first 10 minutes of the second half. Equally as impressive, the Hoosier defense held the Buckeyes scoreless in the second half. Final score, 34-7 in favor of Indiana with the top scorer, Will Chevalier, with two tries. Indiana clinches a home game for the D1A playoffs, which has Mark Cuban doing backward somersaults and Nate Ebner ready to take out some frustrations on his next NFL opponent. In the Mid-South, Life's Running Eagles versus Navy's Midshipmen. 19 zip at the half in favor of life, but Navy returned with 19 points of their own in the second half. Winger Darrell Williams would get one try on the board for life in the second half, however, and that would be the difference maker as life was able to hold off the midshipmen's comeback. While in the same conference, Life, Navy, and Lindenwood are all looking like top three teams, and it will be interesting to see who plays for the East Championship in April. Next up, a battle of the Cats with the Davenport Panthers versus the Clemson Tigers. After a quick opening try by Clemson, Davenport took control of the match. The Panthers would score efficiently against a great Tiger defense, and the second half would go back and forth with each team putting tries on the board, but Davenport was always there to match Clemson's comeback efforts and keep the lead safe. Final score, 45-29 Davenport. Top scorer center Enrique Carmona, two tries, and fullback Ralph Sirivanu with two tries. By the way, Davenport is another sleeper pick to upstate the nation's top teams, and they have interesting matchups coming up against Life and Lindenwood. Speaking of Lindenwood, we have head coach Josh Macy on the horn right now, but you're going to have to wait until after this. If you're in New York City and want to watch some great rugby, have some great food, and some great times, go to the world's best rugby pub, The Pig and Whistle, on West 36th Street. Hey, rugby fans, rugby is everywhere. The giant is awakening, and Rugby Wrap-Up is there with the alarm clock. Rugby Wrap-Up, global rugby coverage, sometimes with a wake. Weekly studio shows, daily website content, breaking news, evolving stories, the biggest names in the game on camera, all over social media. Pundits from all corners of the planet, local, global, professional, amateur, female, and male. Find it all on RugbyWrapUp.com. And we are back. And ladies and gentlemen, we have Mr. Josh Macy, the head coach of Lindenwood, joining us on the Irish Rugby Tours Monitor. Josh, welcome to the program. Hey, thanks for having me. It's great to see you, my friend. Sir, you are a, a rare breed of coach, I guess. You are exceptional in the sevens code and in the fifteens code. How did you come about becoming a head coach of a college program, a, an excellent college program? Um, most of it's just right place, right time. Uh, I did a lot of just sport coaching in the summer camp world uh, before starting the program at AIC and then uh, kind of a chance meeting, was coaching with former Lindenwood coach J.D. Stevenson as he was moving on to USA Rugby, and uh, he he suggested that I fill in for him as he departed, and here we are. I think you're being a tad humble, my friend, but before we continue, is uh, is that the makings of or, or an attempt at like a Movember kind of thing going on there, or are you just five o'clock shadow? No, no, no. We are avid Movember participants here in St. Charles, Missouri. Uh, this is now my wife's least favorite month of the year. I, of it. Well, I'm, I'm going to have to concur with your wife. I like you better clean shaven. That's just me. Sevens and fifteens when you're coaching both codes, right? How does that help you with the players? 
So I, I think there's more in common than people think. Um, you know, to be successful in sevens in particular, you, you know, you need to be accurate with your skills. You need to be urgent off the ball, right? And you need to execute on the day. And there's no reason you can't develop those things in 15s. Um, you know, so we just kind of wrap all of that into like what we expect out of the guys here. And it goes well for us. I like that. So is there a specific Josh Macy stamp on a team? I think uh, enjoyment is probably the first part of it. Like we, you know, we do this for a living that myself and the other coaches, because we enjoy it players, we want showing up every day and enjoying their rugby. Um, you know, accountability, you know, has to, has to be the other side of that. You know, we can't, we can't all just like have a great time all the time. Sometimes we have to do the hard stuff and hold each other to standards. And then lastly, we want competition. We want to play the best teams and we want to compete with each other and have a really great competitive environment in practice. Uh, because that that's how we improve every day. We know, you know, day in and day out, we're going to get as much work on a Tuesday or a Thursday or whatever as we do on a Saturday. And that's the end goal. How how dare you, sir, include fun in rugby? How dare you? It's it's tough, but we manage. All right, fair enough. Your next matchup, Davenport. What are you looking for out of your guys against them, and how important is this match? Every Mid-South game is difficult uh, and important uh, because it comes down to the wire every year. Uh, Davenport's much improved. Lance Oya's done a really good job up there, and he's got a nice, uh, a nice set of backs up there. You know, so we're just looking to stay on our feet in defense and close down as much space as we can, and kind of just take away uh, as much as we can from them um, because they do have some guys that can hurt you. All right, they've got some weapons. You've got some weapons. Where would your where would you say your strengths are? And I, and and it's no secret because there's tons of film out there already. But for people that haven't had the opportunity to see your team play, who what would you say your strengths were? Uh, we're a really well-rounded team. Um, you know, we do have playmakers all over the field, but you know, we 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 back our set piece platform. Um, but you know, if the game falls apart and you know we get into a kicking battle or a ton of transition, like we're comfortable on that as well. Um, so I think just, again, our balance and really the guys have been working hard to develop a sort of, um, you know, tactical discipline that, that is going to really help us come playoffs in April and May. All right. So coach, I got to put you on the hot spot before I let you go. Other than you guys winning the national championship, who do you think is going to win? Well, I think the front runners have to be life and Cal, like it's their championship to lose, uh, you know, they're definitely the, the standard we're all chasing. Um, beneath, you know, I think we have a great shot as well as St. Mary's. And, you know, there's lots of other teams, too. Like we have, uh, like Navy is hyper competitive now. Um, Arkansas State, you know, on any given day can beat anybody uh, with the playmakers they have down in J Jonesboro. So, I mean, just right there, there's more uh, contenders for a national championship than at any given time in college rugby. So you got to be happy with that. Well, I'm, I'm happy to have you, and you guys are doing great, and it's great to see your programs and, and programs like this popping up all over the country and being able to, to be mentioned in the same breath as Cal and Life. You know, it's a, it's a good thing for the growth of the game, as they say, and I want to thank you for taking time out and coming on the show, Coach. Happy to be here. Thanks, McCarthy. And that was Coach Josh Macy. We'll be right back with Mr. Ryan Ginty of Next Level Rugby, who is not only at the Big Ten Conference Championship – but he'll be at the Liberty Conference matchups this coming Saturday. Don't go away. If you're in New York City and want to watch some great rugby, have some great food, and some great times, go to the world's best rugby pub, The Pig & Whistle, on West 36th Street. 
rugby fans, rugby is everywhere. The giant is awakening, and rugby wrap-up is there with the alarm clock. Rugby wrap-up, global rugby coverage, sometimes with a wink. Weekly studio shows, daily website content, breaking news, evolving stories, the biggest names in the game on camera, all over social media. Pundits from all corners of the planet, local, global, professional, amateur, female, and male. Find it all on RugbyWrapUp.com. And we are back, and we have Mr. Ryan Ginty of Next Level Rugby on the Irish Rugby Tours monitor wearing a USA Eagles Tours shirt. No conflict there, folks. It's all rugby. But, Ryan, welcome. Well, Matt, it's uh, exciting to be back. It's uh, been quite uh, – done a lot of traveling lately, but excited to uh, produce an event back here in uh, our backyard in Fairfield, Connecticut at uh, Rafferty Stadium this weekend for the Liberty Conference uh, Championship and Series. Uh, Going to have nine games total. Seven of them are going to be streamed live for you. Three of them are going to be shown in at least 16 million homes. And uh, we're pretty excited about the matchups that we have this weekend. So that's on For the Fan Network, which is still 11 sports, right? Yes. So uh, For the Fan is going to be picking up a lot of college rugby. And the great thing that they're offering is zero paywall. Um, For the Fan, FTFnext.com is where you can find uh, four of the matches. Uh, three of the matches, which are going to be the premier broadcast matches, are going to be going to Linear 11 Sports uh, Network. And uh, if you want to access those, I'm going to let you guys in on a little secret. It's called Pluto.tv. Free television, no paywalls. Uh, you get a bunch of channels, and 11 Sports is on there as well. And it's available Roku app and streaming anywhere digitally online. All right, so uh, we're taping this earlier in the week. I've got the matchup starting at 8.30 a.m. and the last one kicking off at 7.30 p.m. Is that still pretty much what's going on? Well, Matt, uh, yeah, I would say so. 8.30, kicking it off with Stony Brook versus Colgate, and we're just going to roll all the way through. That last match is going to be Fairfield, the host team, taking on your Buffalo boys that are sitting at 6-1. and one. That's going to start at 7 o'clock, not 7.30. All right, and that was a switch to what accommodate the championship match? So that was uh, that was just a switch, so that way we could get all the matches. There is a TV window at one o'clock, a three o'clock, and a five o'clock match. So in order to fit that TV window, we had to do a little bit of adjusting. Um, but I think it's going to be a good day. All right. So other than my University of Buffalo Bulls winning seventy-five to zip over Fairfield, my cousin uh, Robert he- Robert Doc Hines's Fairfield team, uh, what can you tell me about the marquee matchups? Well, so you got a couple of really good matchups, right? The three that are targeted right there, Iona versus St. Bonaventure. Excited about that one. Iona coming in 5-2, and 5-0 and oh in the Liberty Conference. They're going to be playing Rugby East uh, team. That's going to be St. Bonaventure in a rematch of last year, what was an instant classic. Those two teams slugged it out, went back and forth. We had a huge crowd, probably about 400, 500 people there just to watch that game. Um, so I'm excited for that. Uh, you know, the Siona team only losing to Army and Navy, which uh, both those teams are powerhouses in their own right. Um, and again, you know, it's uh, St. Bonaventures. They don't have a winning record, but they are playing the toughest competition on the East Coast without a doubt. Yeah, and the respective faces of the franchises, the two coaches, Bruce McLean is kind of like Rocky and Tui Osborne is kind of like Apollo Creed. You know, you got that smooth versus the not so smooth. Uh, I must say you got two great coaches that are going to be going head-to-head, and uh, I will say both those coaches have a lot of respect for each other. They enjoy competing against each other, and they're both needle movers in the collegiate rugby landscape. And you also got that Massachusetts matchup, right? Yeah, so uh, not to be overshadowed, the championship, Boston College versus Northeastern. This is going to be a Boston grudge match coming in here. Boston College having beaten are are having lost only to Northeastern. Northeastern's coming into this undefeated. Uh, This is a matchup. These two teams, uh, they played each other October 5th with uh, Northeastern coming out on top 42 to 33. So that's going to be a good one. And then in the third place matchup, you got AIC taking on Syracuse. Both these teams you would think would want to be in this championship game. Syracuse coming in here. uh, They've been a great 7-1. Their only loss coming to Boston College, one of those teams competing for that Liberty Rugby Conference Championship spot. You've also got Oswego showing up, Binghamton showing up, Fordham showing up, Tufts and Cortland. So there's a there's a large uh, representation of the geography of our region here. I would say, right? 
Yeah, and as is with the Liberty Rugby Conference, uh, it is set up into three different divisions. You have your Empire, I-95, and your New England division. Uh, 20 teams here up in the Northeast, and they're basically coming in one weekend. Everybody comes together, one big event, playing in a stadium, having good production, you know, getting everybody together, and then going to finish out the fall season with a bang and uh, crown a champion, and then also provide a couple other uh, good matchups and great entertaining rugby for all to watch and see. Yeah, and you, you mentioned quality production. You guys are front and center in that with Next Level Rugby, and I am very tickled that you called me to help you out with the calling of the matches for Next Level Rugby. I'm very, very excited about that. But we talked about your travel, and I know you're in Japan for the Rugby World Cup, that old thing. But I'm more excited about you telling us a little bit about the Big Ten Championship with Ohio State and Indiana at the Fortress. Yes, yeah, so uh, Big Ten, uh, great matchups. Uh, you had Illinois taking on Michigan. Michigan played three games in the last week before coming in. This was their third game in a week to play. They had to do the reschedule of the Battle of the Mint, which determined who was going to go play for the uh, third place. So those guys came out not able to get it done against that team. Illinois looked really good. They came out firing. And then you had Indiana versus Ohio State. Ohio State leading going into halftime, you know, 7-5. to five. But then Indiana would just come out, and they'd just uh, come out led through Joey Blakely and then Will Chevalier in the 13th spot. I mean, those guys were pretty good putting up two tries and a try piece. Uh, so that was really exciting, really good. Unfortunate for the Ohio State boys, this has been four times they have been here and they have lost. So I yeah. guess we can call them the Buffalo Bills of the Big Ten Championship right now. <laughs> Jim Kelly's Bills, of course, they lost to my New York Giants. Uh, wide right, Scott Norwood. But we'll get into the NFL aspect of this some other time. But we could bring up Nate Ebner. Uh, he was an Ohio State guy, and he's not happy. But he's, as we said earlier in the in the broadcast, Ryan, he's going to take it out on some other NFL opponent this week. Who's going to win the championship? Well, Matt, I got a definite winner for you, and it's going to be rugby. But I'm not just going to say rugby. I'm going to say the viewer. Why? Because you can watch these games for free on For the Fan uh, and Eleven Sports. Uh, Captain Copout Ryan Ginty on from Next Level Rugby here on Rugby Wrap Up. Thank you, my friend. I look forward to seeing you very early Saturday morning. All right. Make sure you get that early train in, Matt, and there will be plenty of coffee for you. Copious amounts, if you will. And that allows us to segue to our player of the week. That's right. Our segues are on steroids and lift us right out of the studio for this particular player. And while this gentleman is no longer a student, there's nobody on the American landscape that represents the path to success on USA soil in rugby than this guy. High school, college. Let's let him tell you about it. With that, we welcome Mr. Chris Matina of Rugby United New York. Chris, welcome. Yeah, happy to be here. Uh, thanks for having me on. Chris, we have college players watching, but we also have those in high school and even kids watching. Tell them about your pathway. Yeah, so I started at Xavier High School uh, when I was a freshman. Uh, you know, my dad had played rugby, but I always wanted to play football. But, um, you know, going to Xavier, we had a really good program and they wanted me to play. So I went out there and kind of fell in love with it from uh, day one. Your dad played, which means I probably played against him, and in all likelihood, he ran over me a couple hundred times. Was it watching him play, or was it more watching the kids at Xavier High School play rugby that got you interested? I think it was uh, seeing other kids at Xavier play. Um, our whole football team would play rugby, so you know it kind of just fit. I was doing everything that I was doing on a rugby field, on the football field. I was kicking, playing defense, playing offense. So. It seemed like a natural fit, and uh, you know, it, it really was seamless for me to kind of go into it. My dad had a background in it, so he saw no problem. This is a college show, and I want to know for you, looking back now, how has the college landscape changed? Um, you know, I think it, it's getting a lot better. Um, you know, I think there's a lot more co better coaches, a lot more, you know, in the age of the internet, you can, you know, do a lot uh, better things with, you know, your time. And, um, you know, I think I learned a lot in terms of leadership, um, you know, having to kind of teach guys because they're, they're guys in college that have never played rugby before. So you kind of have to lead those guys. And, um, you know, it helps you as a player. But, you know, in the end, I think um, it's grown a lot. And there are more varsity programs out there. And the better the coaches get and the better the programs get, uh, the better college rugby will be. And what coaches had the biggest influence on you? Yeah, I mean, obviously, 
Mike Tolkien is the number one. Uh, he was my coach in high school uh, for three years, and then my Rooney coach last year, so that's been awesome. Um, and then in college, it was Bjorn Haglid, uh, who was a bit quirky, but, um, you know, we really bought into him as a coach, uh, you know, at Delaware. And then Biddy Boyle and uh, Chris Ryan were my two sevens coaches. And, um, you know, during that time where we were suspended, I got to play for Atlantis and they had a big part in getting me there. And I think that was you know, vital to my growth as a, as a men's rugby player and kind of getting that experience while I was in college, um, you know, and obviously Strew Murray, who's the interim coach or the, the year, the coach that, you know, helped us get back on campus. And, um, you know, I had a vital part of putting him there for that fifth year. So, um, you know, he had a big impact on my college career as well. When was it that it dawned on you? When was that moment where you said, oh, wait, I can play professional rugby? Um, you know, it's kind of tough. I think during those years of, our suspension when I started playing men's rugby uh, my junior and senior year you know when we were suspended that kind of um, gave me the confidence you know when you play against grown men and you know you figure that you know they're big but you know you can you can do a lot of different things and you know that's kind of where I started to figure out my game and then doing my fifth year um, you know that helped me a lot and i think i matured a lot in that process and i think that really helped me and i've been through a lot of different stuff so um you know coming back and doing that fifth year and and kind of guiding that team to you know 500 or winning record you know with nobody you know really there for the last two years i think that was kind of when i was like you know i could kind of do something with this yeah you're referring of course to some of the off the field kerfuffle that had the the uh, program suspended for a bit of time but you made the best of it And in fact, what's interesting for me is that you represent a new generation, a second generation of players that we haven't had. And truly, you are a pioneer in you have taken that pathway and turned it into a professional rugby career all in the United States. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, club level has a lot to do with that. Obviously, I got noticed from NIAC in the national championship game in 2017. So. Um, you know, the club level's huge, but, you know, I'd really like to see it be a little bit clearer for guys. Um, you know, I think USA Rugby can do, you know, some some stuff with kind of aligning that. And now that MLR's around um, and, the, you know, the Rooney Academy and, and stuff like that's going to get going, I think all USA Rugby really needs to do is align everything up in, in terms of trainings, in terms of schedule. And it's very hard to do. Um, you know, with such a big country and, you know, colleges are all over the place and, and players are all over the place. So I think, you know, if they can give it a little bit more direction and alignment, uh, you know, I think it'll be a lot easier because uh, I've had to do it the hard way. But, you know, I hope in the future I can also help since I know it so well and my goal is to, to help it and kind of help them align, you know, those pathways from college to academy to club to, to eventually national team. and and uh, the professional level. And how cool is it that you get to line up in a back line with Ben Foden and Matthew Bestereau? Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, you know, I get to learn from the best, you know, that, that there's been. And, you know, I'm really excited to have those guys in. And I've learned so much in the last year in terms of 15's knowledge, like, you know, going from, you know, club level to that and surrounded by all these guys has been awesome for me. And, you know, I was able to use that in this NIAC season. And now it's going to be ramped up even more with Bastro. Yeah, he could be at 13, he could be at 8. You know, we have no idea where he's going to be. So, uh, you know, it's going to be really interesting. But he seems like a great guy. I've talked to him a little bit so far. So, um, you know, we're really looking forward to having him there. And there you have it, Mr. Chris Matina, the rarest of rare, a New York City born and bred professional rugby player and a shining example, not just to college players out there, but to all players out there. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate it. The Rugby Wrap-Up Player of the Week. And on that note, I'm Matt McCarthy with this week's Rugby Wrap-Up College Rugby Report from Midtown Manhattan, signing off.